Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Let's begin with prayer. Father, you are the great and awesome God, and you work in mysterious ways, things we don't understand, why you do, how you do, what you do. Most of the time we're just uh, hanging on, trying to figure out what to do next, and we pray that we would always do that in response to your direction. This morning, as we continue to study things that uh, are often taken out of context, we, we trust that, that we would understand what you want us to understand from these passages and that we would, we would process it well and that we would uh, be changed in how we minister and how we serve because we understand your word a little bit better. And because we understand your word a little bit better, we know you a little bit better. Thank you for all that are here or in the sound of my voice. We just trust that you would be honored by everything we, and we do and say. Thank you, Father, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're in Lesson 2. As you see, you can, if you uh, need the links, there they are. I have tested them. My own self ad nauseum. And they work just fine. See? Okay, enough of that. Today I've got several verses that we can cover. And we're going to start with one of the most infamous verses used out of context. And that is Jeremiah 29.11 which says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I have a Mudlove bracelet with Jeremiah 29, 11 on it. I love the verse. But, How have you heard people use this verse? To, die, to say everything is good. <clears throat> to say everything is good? Everything is good in life going forward. Okay. To whomever. I, I'll, I'll admit I haven't, I've not heard it said that way. Well, I mean, when, when things are tough, that's when people pull that out. You know, well, God's going to take care of you. Yeah, okay. That's, that's where I'm going with it. How else have we heard that used? This is a, this is a favorite one of the, of the prosperity doctrine, uh, folks. For I know the plans that for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. In other words, God's just going to give you good stuff. God's just going to give you good stuff. Also, um, it's a way to kind of dis discount the factor that there are uh, evil... Uh, Spiritual attacks. Okay. There are. Always. Who, uh, who is this verse written to? <coughs> I'm sorry? Israelites. Israelites, yeah. Turn on your microphone, Nancy. <laughs> Just leave them on. It'd be easier. <laughs> yeah, I don't want them to hear me chewing. If you look at verse 1, it's to the leadership. You mean this one? These are the words 
of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people from Nebuchadnezzar and yeah. taken into exi exile from Jerusalem to Babylon? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Leadership, not necessarily every Jew. Well, Jeremiah to the surviving elders and to the priests, it's an ellipsis, so, and to the uh, prophets I'm and all the people. All the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the people that Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, all the people in exile, right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's not necessarily a promise to every Jew everywhere at any time. Mm -hmm. it, it is specifically a promise to the Jews in exile. You could, you could probably refine this even more, you know, on the K-Bar Canal, as, as uh, Ezekiel put it. Yeah, this, this passage is written to, uh, is to uh, Jews taken into exile. It's not a promise to us, right? It, God promised Jeremiah to speak to the exiles already in Babylon. Mm -hmm. They were dealing with losing their nation and losing their, their place of worship. Sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. And they thought it could never happen. But there they were in exile in a foreign nation. Mm -hmm. What God gave to Jeremiah to tell the exiles was that God still had plans for them. It was not over for them. Being in exile, and, and they should have known this, but we have a tendency not to look at those things. They should have known that God told them it would only be a temporary exile. It wouldn't be a permanent exile. But God has still had plans for them. He'd ultimately include Israel prospering. And we see that. You know, they come back from from exile, their society is completely changed, their focus is changed and so forth, and they prosper for a little while. They're never free again, but they prosper for a little while. Israel needed to see that there was hope in following God. When does God really prosper Israel? See, just leave it on. Crunch, crunch, crunch. <laughs> Not until, yes, not until what we call the millennium. Millennial kingdom, right. See, Brian eats, eats stuff that has no crunch because it has 14 pounds of peanut butter on it. Yeah, There's no way it could crunch. Right, unless he has crunchy peanut butter, but, <laughs> but that makes him a mush mouth when he's got... <laughs> <laughs> it really sucks when it gets stuck in your beard. <laughs> You never yeah. go hungry. Shave your beard. <laughs> so Jeremiah is given this verse to encourage the exiles who are looking at their life in despair. Woe is me, everything's, everything's gone. You know, we've lost our place of worship. We've lost how we're going to do things. We can't do what we used to do. But this verse is often taken out of that context to tell people that God has plans to prosper them and give to them. It all depends on them, according to the way this verse is presented. That's not at all what the verse teaches. I missed a question in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the, here's the question. You should see it on your notes. What then does this verse teach Christians, the followers of Jesus? It's, it's included in the, in the canon of Scripture that, that God has preserved for us. What do we get out of this verse? Well, it does tell us that the Lord has our welfare in, in that he's taking care of us, but it doesn't say that everything we get is good. Correct? Um, I think we would go to like that first part, the words of the letter, um, that God's... Oh, to, of the verse? Yes. Of verse 20, uh, 29, 1? Mm -hmm. These, These are, are the words, words of the letter, the, the time of, of what God has provided for us, um, has communicated us is um, ongoing. Okay. Um, 
continuation of God's sovereignty? If we go back to the verse, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I suppose you could draw a principle from this. Who are the people that God has a plan for? In this case, the Jews. it's his chosen people, the Jews, right? In, uh, this, in the dispensation we're in, who are God's chosen people? The ones he has saved. The Jews. It, well, okay. They were the chosen people. God is consistent. <laughs> they are still the chosen people. And, and in this dispensation, who are the chosen all the ones that he has called. You're looking at the church, right. I think, mm -hmm. but... We're still his chosen people, right? He called us, yeah. he chose us. Right. So, that's what Paul means, that we're grafted in. Mm -hmm. Not grafted into being Jews, but grafted into being chosen. Mm -hmm. So, if the principle for Jeremiah's time is that God has plans for them, and has, as I think Elaine put it, their best interest at heart in the future... In our dispensation, we are also God's chosen, mm -hmm. and he has a plan for us, and uh, a future, and a hope. Mm -hmm. That does not necessarily mean you'll get everything you want here. Mm -hmm. I can't say because of this verse, oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Much as I'd like to, like to have, be able to claim that, I can't. So principally, we could say, because we are God's chosen, he has a plan for us. Mm -hmm. And that plan includes a future and a hope. I said to care for each other yeah. and hope. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The principle is that God is sovereign and cares for his people. God has a plan for us all. But that does not necessarily include plans to prosper you or financially or physically give to you questions or comments on this uh, verse you can smell that peanut butter all the way over here <laughs> holy cow okay let's go on to the next one Matthew 18 verse 20 for where there are two or three for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there, I, there am I among them. When you read this verse, what do you think of first? Three friends um, are together. God's there, hanging out. Okay, that's, that is the most common way to see that verse, right? A lot of people use this to argue that uh, that uh, two or three people get together, that's, that's enough to worship God. Or that could be a church. Or um, whatever, however. Right? God's always with us. Yeah, he's omnipresent, he can't right. not be with us, right? right. <laughs> so the second part of that question then is, how is this verse commonly understood and taught? understood and taught by, by most everyone, that if two Christians get together, God's there. As though that's some sort of mystical formula mm -hmm. that two Christians have to be together for God to be present somewhere. He's there all the time. What, what do you think, you, you have the notes in front of you, so you probably know this already, what do you think this verse is about? Look at the context of it here in Matthew uh, 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, <coughs> excuse me, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen, even... To the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two, 
if uh, two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So, what's the context? What's the context of this, uh, of the target verse about? Simple gatherings? Challenging a brother. Yeah, church discipline. Church discipline. Yeah, absolutely. That completely changes how you approach verse uh, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Two or three gathered for what in the context? True. Discipline True. Of, a, of, a, of an offending brother. Mm -hmm. How does then that change what you think about this verse? Does it change what you think about this verse? Apparently not. <laughs> well, like we said, I mean, Jesus is always there with one, two, three, fifty, a hundred, whatever. But now, in the light of church discipline, this is, you don't want to be having to do church discipline. No, you don't. And it's rarely done anymore. Yeah. So... So somebody try to articulate a, uh, a principle from this verse. This verse. <laughs> verse. It's a peanut butter. It's like a sleep. Somebody give me a principle. We take the context of thinking that it's a number of people gathering, but really it's trying to say to your fellow brother, hey, you're going down the wrong path. Okay. The guiding post. Okay. If a problem or situation occurs, it should be resolved directly and according to God's word. Very good. <clears throat> the context of 1820 is church discipline. Jesus is telling the church, the church's future leaders, remember this is, this is before the church is established. He's He's talking to his, his disciples who would become apostles and he's uh, telling the future church leaders when church members agree they will receive guidance from God. The phrase two or three is a figure of speech in Israel that recognizes the part of the whole. Um, it doesn't explicitly mention two or three people but any number more than one. Two or three is a way of saying the group. It's not specifically two or three. It's any part of the group that's more than one. It's, it's a colloquial uh, Jewish saying. The word agree in verse 19 literally means sound out together. So you're, you're in a situation of church discipline and you have a conversation, the process as outlined in the, in the text, if your brother sins against you, you go to him privately. If he repents and things are fixed, then you've gained a brother, Jesus said. But if he doesn't, then take two or three witnesses, two or three others, again, a part of the whole, so any number, probably, Two or three is not a bad way to go. Otherwise, you're going to gang up on them, but you understand what the, the symbolism of the words mean. Um, so the charge may be established by, again, a part of the whole. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Take it to the entirety of the church. And if he refuses to listen to even a church, then you treat him as a Gentile. How is that? How, how does the church treat a Gentile? By the way, the modern church does it wrong. I suppose in olden times, maybe they just shunned them. Or yeah, that's exactly right. Kicked them out. Kick them out. Yeah. Until, they're, until they're ready to repent. Right. 
Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Why, why would something like that happen? And, and what does that mean? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever is loosed will be loosed. If you gain your brother, mm -hmm. then because you're doing it in, in, in the, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, where two or three, a part of the whole, agree, then that's, that's from God, and he puts his stamp on it. And if you have to throw him out, that's also mm -hmm. with the approval of God. And then we, he goes on to say, Again, I say to you, if two or three, part of the whole, on earth, ask anything. Ask what? In the context of this, what are you asking for? God, help us deal with this church discipline. Help us figure out how to do it right. And that's the brother be restored. Right. Restoration. Right. That's the goal, but it's not always the end result. No. For two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. In other words, this comes from God if you are agreeing, literally sounding out together. The whole Holman New Testament commentary says, agree is from sum, sum theno, literally sound out together, meaning harmonize. Anything you ask for in this context means an appeal to God for support of witnesses' actions to restore the sinning brother or to excommunicate him. By his reference back to a few details from 18 verse, chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, Jesus was implying a connection to all of the details. So in this if clause, Jesus was saying the condition upon which God will base his endorsement of your disciplinary activity is your pursuit of your brother with a zealous love of the Father in your hearts and with careful attention to the guidelines I've given. If we follow these guidelines, the fulfillment of God's will concerning the sinning brother will be done for you by my Father in heaven. By his promise to be present with them, Jesus claimed a role belonging only to the Almighty. And we see, we see that in, in a couple of verses. In Joel, 20, or Joel 2, 27, You shall know that I am the Lord in the midst of Israel, that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Or in Zechariah 2, 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in, their, in your midst and you shall know that I'm the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. His promise was a claim to his deity and his giving to us the direction that we need. So where two or, three people, two or three are gathered in my name, so am I there with you, is a claim to his deity and his enablement of us to see his direction. The uh, Grace New Testament commentary says this, The Father promises to do anything that two or three believers agree on in Christ's name. The prayer in this context is for the divine guidance in handling the delegated authority mentioned in the previous verse. Of course, it would apply to any legitimate prayer uttered in faith in accord with God's will. The point is that the smallest possible gathering of believers will be heard if they unite in prayer. The prayer will be heard because Jesus is in the midst of them. His presence guarantees the Father's intervention on behalf. This also implies Jesus' omnipresence. Questions or comments on this one? This is a difficult one because the whole idea of church discipline doesn't seem to, in most people's view of verse, of verse 20, church discipline doesn't enter, even though they just read it four verses earlier. It, it gets forgotten by the time they get to that verse. 
and then understanding the context becomes clouded because of, of our reticence to do church discipline. Other questions or comments? Okay, and then let's go on to another one that's like it. John 14, 13, and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Are you saying Jesus is lying? No. We're not there to ask him to change his mind. He's not a genie. Right. Buddha belly? <laughs> he knows what he's going to do. Yes, we put our petitions before him, but we are not there to change his mind. Okay. How, how have you heard these verses uh, applied? Oh, Lord, I want a Mercedes-Benz. Oh, Lord, I want <laughs> yep. a Mercedes-Benz. I was going to say, uh, win the lottery. Yeah. It reminds yeah. me of the, uh, the movie scene from Bruce Almighty. Again, it's, yeah. it's a staple of the name and climate mm -hmm. theology. Somebody in Florida just won the, uh, Big time. the Mega Ball. Uh, what was it, $1.5 billion? Billion. Would it be? But they're only taking the payout of like seven hundred and thirty-eight right. million. Only, yeah. Yeah. only, exactly. Only. They're going to be poppers for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we 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 see this verse used in lots of ways by the 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 prosperity doctrine peddlers. Ask whatever you want. Just send me twenty dollars. I mean, you got there's always that tag on the on the online preachers, right? Ask Jesus whatever you want, and he'll give it to you. Just send me $20. But look closely. Do these verses tell us that God will give us anything we want? No, they don't. Look closely at verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. That the Father might be glorified in the Son. So, does that give us any criteria about what we should be asking for? Do these verses, do these verses uh, stand all by themselves, or are they part of a much larger teaching on prayer? It's obviously a much larger teaching on prayer in, in Scripture. It's rare for a verse to stand by itself without the interaction and the application of other verses. But we should at least read the, the entire paragraph in order to get the context, right? Truly I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these uh, will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. This pericope is not about prayer and our receiving answers to our prayers. It's about our ministry for Jesus. The context of those of that statement by Jesus, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Um, whatever you ask for in my name, this I'll do. The context of that is serving God. So in that context, what we ask for, he will do. So let's begin at verse 12. Jesus tells his disciples they will do greater works than he did. That's a curious phrase, isn't it? Jesus, the greater sustainer of the universe, who sacrificed himself on the cross and beat death, stood there and told his disciples, look, you're going to do greater things than I do. So how do you understand that statement? Maybe he meant physically on earth that people would see. I think that's exactly right. Uh -huh. 
greater things will you do physically, observable things will you do physically. Jesus is not talking about his creative work. He's not talking about his salvific work. He's talking about his physical work. The miracles that he did, the things that showed that he was the Messiah, etc., etc. Clearly, no one could do more than the Savior of the world. No one can do more than the creator, sustainer of the world, right? Everybody that does anything is doing it because they're given power by Jesus. So clearly, Jesus does more. And so in the context of what he's saying here, we should see this only as his, his physical activities on earth prior to the cross. I think Jesus was saying that his disciples, the church's future leaders, would have many more years to minister. We should not interpret greater as more significant or of more value, but greater as longer. Jesus had three, three and a half, some argue as, as short as a year and a half, although the, I think those guys are nutballs, um, three and a half years of ministry before he went to the cross. Most of the disciples, most of the apostles, had 20 or 30 years afterwards to minister. So obviously there's going, it, greater as longer makes complete sense. The hint to this understanding comes from the last phrase of verse 12. Greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. In other words, my time on earth is coming to an end. Three and a half years of ministry, 33 and a half years of, or 33 years of, of life. Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday morning of death. Alive again, 40 days of ministry, gone. So greater works than these he will do because I'm going to the Father. Jesus' earthly ministry would be over, but the disciples would go on for many more years. Then on the heels of that statement, Jesus tells his disciples, while he's gone to the Father and doing more ministry than, uh, tells his disciples they'll be doing more ministry than they did, they can ask him for stuff in his name. What's the context of that ask? Your ongoing ministry that is of longer duration than his. So in the, in the scope of the ministry that they're called to, we can appeal to God for direction. We can appeal to God for authority. We can appeal to God for miracles and so forth. Now, question. What does in my name mean? Authority? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, have a long quote here from R.A. Torrey. Uh, R.A. Torrey compares praying in your own name with presenting a check to a bank. It will not be cashed if we do not have sufficient funds to cover the amount. But if we go to the bank where the person's name signed the check and that person has greater resources in his account then the check will be honored. Tory concludes, so it is. When I go to, the, go to God in prayer, I have nothing deposited in heaven, and I will go in my own name, I will get absolutely nothing. But Jesus Christ has unlimited credit in heaven, and he has granted to me the privilege of going to the bank with his name on my checks, and when I thus go, my prayers will be honored to any extent. I thought that was just a, a, a great illustration. A, a, a bank, a, a check from an account with Harper's name on it will get nothing at a bank. You can get $4,500 less from my account now because somebody <laughs> stole it this week. But you will get more money out of my account than out of, out of uh, Harper's, mm -hmm. right? The same is true. If I go to God and say, this is what I want. Okay. If I go to God and says, this is what I want, believing that this is what Jesus wants me to want, here it is. 
What's the purpose? What's the purpose of Jesus doing what we ask? Why would Jesus do that? Why would he even hint at something like this? Show he cares. He loves us. He loves he wants us. To... We, we read the answer. Verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In other words, Jesus is giving us what we ask because it brings glory to the Father. Again, that adds some criterion to it, doesn't it? We, we've got to ask the right things. We've got to ask what he wants us to ask, what's in keeping with his plan. As Elaine pointed out earlier, we're not changing his mind because he's immutable. He doesn't, get a, he doesn't have a changeable mind. And most of the time, knowing what he wants for us, knowing is a very difficult thing. Yeah, that, that is absolutely the conundrum of... of of all of the passages on prayer in Scripture, is it's not a blank check. You don't get to ask for your Mercedes Benz. Well, you can ask, but God will say, "Yeah, too bad." Might even not have. Not to, he might just go. Mmm. I don't know. Not for selfish reasons or personal right. merit. Right. It, 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 according to the text, it's so that Jesus will be, or that the Father will be glorified through <coughs> Jesus. So that, that adds to the mixture some criterion of how we're supposed to approach these things. When you put all that Scripture teaches about prayer together, it's always about us conforming to His plan and not Him conforming to our plan. Can you imagine if prayer included God changing so that He conformed to our plan? You think the world is messed up now? Holy cow. I can't imagine what it would be like with that. And what would it be like with two Christians having opposing requests? Right. And, and we know that's a reality even... Now, that, that adds a, a new wrinkle to this whole thing. We know that t at times the Holy Spirit can, leave, can lead two people in different directions on the same topic, right? Mm -hmm. How do we know that? You might think of a biblical example for that. Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas. I don't have biblical, but I have history. Civil War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't know that necessarily both sides were were right. led by the Holy Spirit. I'm thinking of uh, of Paul wanting. You, you talked about this earlier. Paul wanting to go further west and being prevented, or Paul wanting to go to Jerusalem and the elders in the churches he was at, led by the Spirit, telling him not to go, and Paul, led by the Spirit, wanting to go. So here you have a, a case of, of the Holy Spirit saying, do this, and the Holy Spirit saying, do that. They're, they're in opposition, but they're not really. Paul needed to know that the elders were, were caring for him and were wanting to protect him, and Paul needed to go to Jerusalem because that's how he was going to end up being arrested and go to Rome, ultimately. What conclusion can we draw from this all? We have to take all of our requests and run them through this test that does it glorify the Lord? Mm -hmm. Is it what he thinks might be best for us? Is it in his will? But ultimately, does it glorify his name? Is it for our selfish reasons, like Nancy said earlier? Yeah, that's the, that's the problem with all of the prayer uh, teaching in Scripture. Is is it depends on our motivation, and if we're seeking to glorify ourselves, the Lord's not going to honor that because it doesn't give glory to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I'll do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatever you ask in my authority. By that, you can also extrapolate whatever you ask by my direction, by my guidance, that I'm going to do. If you ask what I tell you to ask, you'll get it. But if you don't, you won't. Well, he will provide for us according to what we need, according right. to his will to glorify right. the Father. Right. 
glorification of the Father is always the outcome, the ultimate outcome of everything in his plan. That gives us a lot of comfort, at least it does to me. Questions? It's pretty good timing this week. I've reached the end and I have three minutes extra. So you guys need to talk for three more minutes. You're not doing that very well. No? Come on. How about the question <clears throat> in today's world, <clears throat> what's more expensive? A Mercedes Benz or a Ford Explorer? <laughs> How do I answer that? <laughs> what's more expensive? Mercedes is still more expensive. <laughs> Not the low end, I'm sure. <laughs> well, if you're going low end to low end, a Ford's going to be less expensive <laughs> low end than a Mercedes low end. Uh, Linda said I can have a Mercedes anytime I want. Yeah. We just have to live in it. Yep. Put nice curtains in it. Yeah. <laughs> and even their big ones aren't going to let me do that. So. Well, they have Mercedes uh, SUVs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're definitely not doing that. Okay. Father, thank you for allowing us to spend some time in your word. Looking at verses that are often taken out of context and because of that uh, treated improperly and, and doctrine gets uh, presented improperly. Lord, our desire is always to, uh, to get your word right so that we understand you just a little bit better. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.